Our next presenter is Jennifer Like from Stockton University in New Jersey. I met Jennifer a couple of years ago at a conference in Gettysburg. The conference was called Exploring the Extraordinary. And as a consequence of her talk, she ended up contributing an article to Edge Science. You may want to check that out. Today's talk is Not Everyone Gets Machine Elves, The Nature of Disincarnate Entities and Their Interactions with DMT Users. Hello. Um, so I'm talking today about DMT entities and their interactions with DMT users. So it occurred to me that some people might need a little background before I get started with that topic. Um, DMT is a short abbreviation for dimethyltryptamine, which is a powerful hallucinogen that is uh, involved in ayahuasca, which is a drink used in South American shamanic practices. It is also uh, able to be synthesized separately, and it can be injected or smoked. And uh, it is notable for several reasons, but one of them is that it's extremely powerful, uh, short-acting, and tends to produce hallucinations that are quite vivid and, and unique. And uh, at certain doses, people feel like they have broken through to an alternate reality where they sometimes encounter entities which they sometimes experience as fundamentally separate existences, not projections of their own psychological experience. And sometimes those entities interact with them. Uh, so the title of the talk is, uh, refers to Terence McKenna, who was a famous psychonaut. And he sort of uh, spoke about his own experiences with DMT and described his experiences with the entities um, as sort of prototypically, sometimes they appear as machine elves, self-transforming machine elves that sometimes present as jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs. So this just gives you an idea of the kind of uh, variety of entities that people experience. And, and if you haven't uh, used DMT, then DMT users will tell you you cannot possibly understand. So we should just start with that. Um, so Terence McKenna suggested that anyone who uses DMT enough or long enough will eventually encounter the machine elves. And the part of the motivation for this project was to evaluate, actually, what do people encounter, what types of entities, and what kinds of interactions do they have, because there's actually very little research in terms of um, those questions. There's some popular literature, and there's certainly a lot online, but there's no sort of systematic way to determine what kinds of entities people who use DMT encounter and what kind of interactions they have. So this is just a couple of examples to give you an idea of the variety of DMT entities. Um, so for example, people way out of the proportion uh, to the rest of the scene in a bizarre alien spaceship, um, a woman playing a wind instrument sitting on a gyroscope, and so on. And then the kinds of interactions, there's a variety of interactions. Sometimes the entities are welcoming, sometimes they're hostile, sometimes there's sort of no interaction. Um, these are just some actual examples from the data that I used in my project to give you, to illustrate the variety. So in terms of what I actually did, um, my interest was in getting a large sample of descriptions of DMT experiences. And so I went, of course, to arawid.org, which if you don't know about it, it's a major website that uh, disseminates information regarding psychoactive drugs. And along with lots of other information, there are places for people to report their own experiences using pr different drugs. Um, so I s sorted and collected the, s the stories of reports of people using DMT only. Um, the plenty of people use DMT along with other drugs, but I didn't want to um, confuse the issue. Uh, so I selected just the cases that use DMT only over the last 10 years, so from 2006 through 2015. That ended up being 149 trip reports. 
Uh, sometimes information about the person's age or, and gender were included. And so of the people for whom I had that data, 90% of the sample was male, almost 25 years old. 75% of the reports that I looked at included the description of at least one entity, and 37% described more than one entity. So I had a total of 180 entity encounters to go on. Uh, one of the first things that sort of became clear is that many people mentor, mentioned the gender of the entities, which was sort of a surprise to me that, that so many had genders. Um, but 24% of the cases referred to the gender of the entity. Um, and so I looked at the proportion of male or female DMT uh, users and the proportion of genders reported by the, um, in terms of what the entities were. Male users were significantly more likely to report the gender of entities than females. Not quite sure what that means, except that it might be an artifact of the fact, an artifact of the fact that 90% of the users were male, and so there was a much higher likelihood. But it's still statistically significant, so I would need a larger sample to check that out. And then the entities whose gender was specified were significantly more likely to be female than male. Um, so that is also interesting, as, at least in the sense that ayahuasca itself is sometimes conceived of as female. So, there might, so it's just an open question what exactly that means. But those were uh, two findings related to gender in particular. So the, the main questions in terms of what are the categories of entities um, that emerged in the content analysis, uh, these are the relative proportions. And I you know, tried to condense the categories as efficiently as possible. The largest category were entities that were fundamentally poorly uh, defined or unclear. And so that obviously could be for two reasons. Either the, the person's experience of the entity was not yet clearly defined or they just didn't report it very clearly in their trip report. So there's two possible reasons why that might have occurred. Uh, humanoid entities, and this is in terms of the adjective, were the second uh, most common group. Divine beings, aliens, elves and fairies was number five. Uh, animals and insects, geometric entities or machines, entities that were just voices, just faces, and then a miscellaneous category. So in terms of frequency, the poorly defined category uh, was most frequent. In terms of interactions, there were a wide variety of interactions. Uh, the most common one by far was entities showing, teaching, or guiding the users. Uh, second most commonly, there was no interaction, hostility, warmth or love, welcome or excitement, reassurance or encouragement, observation or neutrality, play, power and control, sexual interactions, interactions that were unclear, the entity questioning the person, the entity reminding the person, and then another miscellaneous category. So in terms of what are the entities doing with people, they're primarily showing them, teaching them, and guiding them in, in uh, terms of their trip experience. So uh, just finally, in terms of relating the type of entity with the type of interaction, the chi-square analysis relating the top, the most uh, five most frequent categories of entity and the five most frequent categories of interaction was insignificant. There is not a pattern there that you might expect if you're thinking that the entities are some symbolic uh, um, archetypal projection. Um, so that was insignificant. Perhaps there is an archetypal component in the sense that male users are more likely to experience um, female entities in the sense of being an anima representation, but that's speculative as well. Certainly there was a wide variety of entities, although not infinite. There are a, a, a relatively small number of categories in terms of what could be experienced in a DMT trip. Um, and the wide variety of interactions weakens the analysis given the number of cases that I had to look at. But what we can conclude is that the machine elves are not actually the norm. Uh, undefined entities are the norm, or humanoid entities are second most common. 
it's possible, given the number of unclear entities, that uh, tr DMT trip experiences sort of evolve over the same course as hallucinations, either in psychosis or influenced by other drugs, that the hallucination commonly develops from a simple, uh, less coherent form into a more complex, more coherent form. So it might be that we just caught these people, they described something that wasn't fully formed. Um, and then finally, I think this area deserves more attention, if only because there are obvious similarities and differences to the other types of entities that are experienced in their other altered states of consciousness, such as ayahuasca. There are some differences. The entity, the discarnates experienced through mediumship, uh, discarnates or entities experienced during near-death experiences, and also in alien abductions. So I think there's more to find out here, but either way, this um, ex exploration of the DMT entities tells us something more about what the human mind is capable of. Thank you. We have time for a couple of quick questions. I have a question about your sample. Mm -hmm. Are there any data which have not relied on people to go self-report, but instead have gone out trying to gather them? Not that I know of. There's actually surprisingly little information. And the, the data that exists is mostly of people who have used DMT and are reporting on their own experiences. Um, I have had a number of experience with uh, ayahuasca. Um, and uh, I've had a number of it, you know, these kinds of experiences. And the common element or thread a lot of in what I've experienced is that there are kinds of like information or messages you know, maybe about life or about what lessons, maybe what I need to know or something like that. And uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of correlation between the type of, you know, mm -hmm. you know let's say, a lot of it just, I think what my, mi my mind is generating various kinds of like images, but then there's an, a deeper current of, oh yeah, this is maybe something I need to know now. Or, uh, it, does this somehow fit into your... Well, research? it doesn't fit into this exactly, but I know what you're talking about, which is that it seems like these experiences lead to something that sort of parallels mystical experiences that are achieved other ways also. Mm -hmm. So that seems to me to be a separate topic, although it might be related to the types of interaction in the sense that the showing, guiding, and teaching mm -hmm. kind of interaction seems to help people have those kinds of realizations that I think you're describing. Hi, excellent presentation. Um, in the lore and in some of the li literature, there's an argument that uh, a kind of threshold dosage is required for the common, uh, common elements of the trip to converge. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your take on that? Well, I had no information about dose. You know, p people would put things down, but it's not reliable. But they certainly seemed to uh, reach a particular threshold, break through, and then usually after that begin to have the entity experience. So it does seem like they're you know, the goal, at least for some users, is to get to that point where you break through um, and then the entities appear, at least subjectively, to exist in the altered reality that's on the other side of the breakthrough. So um, it just seemed to me it would be important to know about them and how they relate to the users. In the world of lucid dreaming, we sometimes and very frequently encounter uh, figures that like you're talking about. So I'm wondering if we self-produce a chemical in our brain that is very similar. Uh, the other thing that kind of surprised me in your talk was the low percentage of geometries. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have expected it to be higher. Um, the, the squares, the shapes, whatever those, what I call the form constants, yes. which have popped up in the literature over the years, particularly in the uh, work with schizophrenics. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you looked into that area. Well, there's two things. One is uh, the DMT does occur naturally in the brain and is associated, or at least speculatively, with dreaming. So it is possible, that's another you know, category that we could put on here in terms of the entities that are encountered in dreams you know, being compared to the entities encountered in these other altered states. So that's certainly reasonable. Right. Um, and then second, in terms of the geometry, the geometric form constant experience seems to be a major part of the beginning of a DMT trip. So I was just categorizing the entities which were primarily geometric. But lots of people describe the geometric experience of the domes or you know, the fractals mm -hmm. and then passing through that mm -hmm. 
where then some of the entities were still geometric or mas machine-like, mm -hmm. some of them were not. Mm -hmm. So it was certainly a major component pre-entity experience. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, when you're comparing this to other altered states, um, it, you know, the way you're phrasing it sounds as if the entity itself is what's changing. But could it not also be the, just the lucidity of the person that's affected and the state that they're in when they encounter the entity? Because you've, you've basically taken a, you know, a chemical and you've altered brain chemistry, um, and then you're altering your own lucidity when you're encountering the entity. Whereas like a, you know, someone that had a projected like lucid out-of-body experience may have a slightly different experience with the same entity because of the, the lucidity state that they were in when they entered that experience versus an NDE, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, I think that we can't locate where the similarities or differences are. But for example, in the alien abduction experience, you know, uh, generally the aliens are not perceived as necessarily as warm and loving and showing and teaching and guiding. You know, often they are perceived as frightening. And it certainly could be the person's you know, level of lucidity because they weren't expecting this, because they didn't smoke DMT trying to have this experience, that would definitely influence the nature of the interaction. And I think this is just a beginning. You know, it would be nice to know what are the factors that cause different kinds of experiences with different kinds of entities in terms of both what's internal to the person who's having the experience and what might actually be external and be, you know, something that is contacted differently depending on the method of getting to the altered state. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lyons.